Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, hi, I'm Daza Greenwood uh, from MIT Media Lab and also executive director of law.mit.edu, which is the convener of today's workshop, the eighth annual MIT Computational Law Workshop. I just wanna start by saying, having done these things since actually the late 90s at MIT on this topic of law and technology, I honestly believe this is the best program yet. And that's owed largely because of what it is we're talking about and, and the speakers that we have to help elucidate what has been a breakthrough with widely accessible generative artificial intelligence and its applications for law and its impact on law and legal processes. So put your seatbelts on. This one is going to be a doozy. So with that, uh, let's, uh, let's get right into it, shall we? Hi, everyone. So we are so thrilled to see the incredible turnout and excited that so many of you are deeply engaged in this topic. Uh, we'll hear the thought-provoking discussions from Professors Dan Katz and Michael Bomarito, as well as the exciting work that Dr. Jesse Hahn and his team at Multitech are doing. It seems we are at the cusp of serious advancements in human-machine collaboration. If we are to consider then the roles and subsequent possible use cases for generative AI, how could we see machines as partners in our legal processes and practice? As we hear about the experiments and ways in which generative AI are finding integration and accelerating our everyday workflows, how do we appropriately account for and mitigate risks and harms of use? On the other hand, how could we be evolving our skill sets to not only enable more efficient practice, but also unlock more creative and critical capabilities? Um, if we could move ahead a couple of slides. Yes, the, sorry, stop at the human. Next slide. I frequently think about the Human Diagnosis Project. This is a worldwide effort created and led by the global medical community to build an open intelligence system that maps the steps to help any patient around the world, in effect, a crowdsource consult. For those of you unfamiliar with this reference, consults are typically a term used to describe conferring with multiple doctors at once for their opinion on whether or not this may be indeed the right diagnosis or treatment plan. The Human Diagnosis Project mirrors this process, but as opposed to a single consult, their tool enables multiple simultaneous consults in a matter of minutes and verified by knowledge sourced from medical experts at the world's leading institutions. Interestingly, the key driver behind the technology is fundamentally this deep collaboration between human and machine. That is, the success of the project is owed to contributions of human expertise to continuously refine the tool's competencies. Widespread positive testimonials from users have shared how the system improves their diagnostic reasoning, not only allowing them to produce differential diagnoses more rapidly, but their ability to think more critically and across highly disparate cases. Evidently, I share this narrative by means of illustrating that we may find inspiration from the Human Diagnosis Project at the advent of generative AI. Perhaps many of you in the audience can agree, medical and legal do share a few similarities, in particular that knowledge management plays a monumental role in the success of the practice. A direct correlation in this specific sense is the idea that we form legal diagnoses, whether it be the act of redlining and contractual review, argument development and case determination, and discovery. The notions of issue spotting, fact finding, risk analysis altogether contribute to a diagnosis. A key difference, of course, is the importance of language as a core element of the field. Next slide. And so at the wake of GPT-4, I have been reflecting on what it means to have a conversation with machines. More importantly, what can we learn from human to human communication that can be applied to human machine communication? Linguists have been reflecting on notions of communicated meaning, through the lens of pragmatics. Pragmatics is largely regarded as extra-linguistic considerations relevant to conversational appropriateness. What is meant may be inferred by what is said on the basis of principles such as cooperation, informativeness, and relevance. Next slide. And so the introduction of cognitive pragmatics or a cognitive system view disrupted the broader field of pragmatics by considering the mental inputs and outputs of communication. Cognitive pragmatics is interested in the structure of dialogue derived from a shared knowledge of an action plan. Next slide. 
Bruno Barra, a renowned scholar in the field, describes how cognitive pragmatics manifest through conversation games. He defines a conversation game as a set of tasks that each participant must fulfill. In short, this translates to party A produces an utterance, party B builds a representation of its meaning. The hope is that this representation is a reconstruction of party A's communicative intent. As discussed, conversation games are intended to be communal, a simultaneous effort to build together. It predicates on some form of a mutual shared premise. In an ideal game, the speaker can predict how the receiver will reconstruct the meaning of the utterance, and the receiver comprehends the speaker and is in fact capable of reconstructing its meaning. However, a key element to conversation games is that the receiver will always react or respond to the speaker, even if the receiver does not necessarily understand them. Accordingly, a conversation game will continuously reset until a congruent representation of meaning is achieved. A conversation game can then be highly ineffective if no shared understanding ever exists or can be reached. In order to mitigate issues of interpretation, the idea is to create a collective belief and to use utterances that are elocutionary acts. Elocutionary acts are a term put forth by J.L. Austin, a philosopher of language, to describe words that express what is done and to be done, so actions. Some examples include assertive, interrogative, and directive statements. In legal contexts, elocutionary acts are no stranger, as the notion of lawmaking frequently relies on the use of directives. Next slide. So why does this matter? There is a powerful analogy to be made between conversation games and how to speak with machines, otherwise engaging with large language models for dialogue. Folks in the audience are likely already familiar, but one of the significant steps that has led to the release of ChatGPT is owed to its predecessor, InstructGPT. InstructGPT applied reinforcement learning to fine-tune GPT-3 to better understand written instruction. Its ability to respond to user instruction, learn from human feedback, enabled progress in the contextual richness of its outputs, though still far from perfect, a much closer alignment to human intention. Similar to the conversation game, the fine-tuning of GPT-3 to human instruction can be regarded as a parallel to the active use of elocutionary acts to mitigate misinterpretation in human conversation. Therefore, it is no coincidence nor surprise that when speaking with machines, we have been perfecting the art of elocutionary acts, namely directives or instructions. Moreover, with the onset of increasingly powerful generative AI models came a rising interest in prompt engineering. This is seen in the development of publicly available prompts to test and experiment with various competencies with ChatGPT, such as these browser plugins that help discover, share, and import prompts while using the tool. One of the clear patterns that have emerged in prompt engineering is representational nature and the use of embodiment. Numerous prompts begin with act as or pretend to be. Other prompts come in the form of specific requests. In either scenario, we see behaviors that are highly performative and elocutionary. So returning to our initial ask of the workshop, what use cases do we see for generative AI? The patterns with which prompt engineering have emerged suggest that legal tasks most amenable involve those that are related to execution, a first cut, a first draft, generating existing boilerplate. Next slide. Yet more complex raising tasks such as issue spotting, enabling creative multi-perspective construction of arguments, collating and inferring meaning at scale, fall short if we are limited to the use of elocutionary acts. We will require additional fine tuning beyond user instruction, but to user negotiation, user critique, user perception. Complementarily, prompts must sufficiently account for why we communicate in addition to how we communicate. And so, how then could we fine tune our models such that they reflect the forms of written legal communication embedded in the interactions of the field, in particular, those that can reveal the strategic uses of language? And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Daza to discuss practical questions about legal prompt engineering. Next slide, please. Great. So um, just to maybe go backwards a little bit and uh, ask the higher level question, um, how could generative AI tools like ChatGPT be used in a legal context? And that's really 
the, that's the underlying sort of assumption that gives rise to all of the observations and questions that Megan was just raising. So just to sort of lay it, lay it out, um, you could use this type of tool for a contract. Well, wait a second, what kind of contract? A first draft of a contract. Um, and actually, is it the previous slide, uh, Ryan? Could you find the uh, standard warnings? I thought I'd put it up front. It might be the it might be a few slides ahead. Let's just start with a warning. Um, next, yeah, uh, that standard should probably be in parentheses, but it does not go without saying, and I think it does not go without emphasizing that this class of technology is not perfect. Um, in fact, it's deeply flawed in some ways. Uh, it provides um, inaccurate and false information, uh, and that has a risk of relying on it uh, too much and just using the first draft as the last draft, for example. Um, it also could raise other legal, higher level policy issues with misinformation. It also has prejudices and biases that were brought in through the training set. So beware of those, of pro propagating those, uh, which can be deeply embedded within the results. And biases is particularly interesting in the legal context, which I'll come back to in a moment for fiduciary duties, but attorneys are one of those roles that owes fiduciary duties of loyalty to our clients. And that means putting the client's interest first. To the extent that the training data includes prioritization of corporate interests or a consumer interest or a you know, some particular government or cultural kind of interest, which can seep in as part of the bias, that may or may not be um, the same as the client's interest that we need to put first. So becoming aware of and a savvy consumer of these outputs um, as an input to us doing our job is critical. Okay, standard. Oh, and the last thing I would just say on this is um, something that um, I'll put it right in the chat here, because these are really words to to live by. Um, this is a quote from Sam Altman, um, who is the, um, the head of OpenAI that provides ChatGPT. ChatGPT is incredibly limited, but good enough at some things to create a misleading impression of greatness. It's a mistake to be relying on it for anything important for now. It's a preview of the progress. So part of why, so now having said that, let's go back to the first slide. Uh, of my segment, please. Um, <clears throat> the reason these warnings are important is because this stuff is amazing. Oh, like I was saying at the start of the workshop, we've just experienced a sea change, uh, like a, a major threshold moment uh, in terms of the capabilities that are now widely available and that have particularly good um, application uh, in for legal use cases. Can we hit the next slide, please? Um, what kind of applications? I mentioned contracts, only the first draft. Statutes, um, which, uh, if, if you've done the pre-reading, you will have seen um, my back and forth with ChatGPT on fiduciary duties. And it came up with what, I mean, I've written a few federal statutes in the US in my time. And it came up with a very good, I would say, first draft of a statute for the particular context that I had provided it. A complaint uh, in a judicial context, deposition questions, a brief, basically anything for a first draft, but it's not just drafts of documents. You know, lawyers were very frequently document paradigm oriented. There's also processes. And I think that the biggest wins might be with legal processes. So for example, um, legal triage is something that Suffolk University Law School has been doing where people can, can individuals can speak in plain language um, and the um, AI can figure out what the relevant context is, can surface the legal issues and then get people to the right person to help them. Um, consumer rights. We're going to hear from Joshua Browder um, at the end of the session. He's doing remarkable things with interactive live real-time um, um, usage of this technology integrated into things like chat bots by companies, but, the, but his tool is representing the consumer interests, getting into a bot versus bot context there, and so much more. Um, next slide, please. One of the really interesting things here that, and something that Megan and I have been working on a, a lot, and you'll hear more about it in 2023, is the late, what you might call the latent knowledge or the capability overhang uh, that happens when you take all of this text and all these, uh, corp, more than one corpus is a corpora um, of, uh, from all across humanity and put it and you vectorize basically the words and the phrases and the concepts um, like in linear algebra, 
interesting patterns emerge that were heretofore unknown. And that could is a new source of knowledge. Um, and it can be used very productively um, in lots of uh, commercial and academic and, and governmental and other use cases. There's so many possibilities. Uh, um, we, we've got some great speakers, so I'm just going to skip across this for now and let, let's go to the next slide. There's a lot on that last slide, though, to, we'll come back to later this year. So legal engineering, meet prompt engineering. You know we love legal engineering at law.mit.edu. Um, and you can look at our media page <laughs> to find um, some deep dives into what we think legal engineering is and why we think it's so important. Um, prompt engineering is a phrase you may have heard. Um, Megan just went into some of the details of it. We think that there's a subset of prompt engineering that is particularly useful in a legal context. And, um, and, and when we when we talk, when I talk about a legal context, that really gets us back to a concept which also resonates in law from evidence, which is relevance. Um, and so one of the critical things to get great results from a prompt in a legal context is to design the prompt so that it provides the relevant context. Um, so by way of an example, and actually, do you mind if I screen share for a quick second, Ryan? Uh, Brian? Uh, yeah, just a moment. Let me uh, let me get out of that. Yeah, there you go. You got it. So um, here's here's just an example. Uh, so um, for deposition questions, um, the, you could ask it, give me deposition questions, and I put a link to this in the chat. But you, if you tell it things like the purpose of the deposition, the specific cases and in, in the parties involved, uh, the some of this other relevant context here in the context of a deposition, it will give you much better ideas for questions that you could ask. Similarly, when I said a draft of a contract, you could say, give me a draft of a contract to buy a used car and you'll get back something that's pretty good. But if you were to ask it, um, I want a draft of a contract for a used car by individuals in the state of California, and include the make and model, the, the purchase price, the, any warranties, et cetera, et cetera. Include this simple plain language in the prompt. Then you will have composed the prompt in, in a certain sense, legally engineered it to make sure that that relevant context is supported and reflected in the draft that you get. And that'll make that draft all the more valuable. Um, one of the things that I, the reason I posted this on our, our uh, workshop uh, GitHub repo is because when I was writing this and I was thinking, what do I say to the workshop participants about what's relevant in these different contexts? One of the things I did, which is a, a new go-to for me since uh, a month and a half, is I went to ChatGPT to ask it, what context would you need in a prompt in order to get the best contract? These were actually answers that I got from ChatGPT saying the context for, for these different things. And I'll tell you what, it was better than my draft. Like these are all twice as long as the examples that I had provided and they're, they're all quite good. Anyway, you can, so let's go back to the slides here. Actually, do you mind taking back the, the helm, uh, Brian? Yeah, um, I'm taking over. Great. Okay, do you um, have it? Next slide. Yep, looks good. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Oh, we already did the warnings. Okay, and so that at, at a very high level are, are a few things about prompt engineering. Um, the, the last thing I'll say, actually go to the previous slide. This one's kind of chilling. Yeah. Um, the, the, the last thing I'll say is, is that um, prompt engineering, so mostly what I was just talking about was prompt construction or just prompt, you know, grammar and syntax and semantics in a way, which is important. You could say that's kind of legal engineering. We craft words. The deeper engineering here is, and we'll see with uh, Jesse Hahn and, and the other people have been doing this, is to be able to sort of integrate the prompts as part of a workflow that can be automated. So there's inputs at certain points. Um, we get an output that becomes an input for another part of a process. We can actually engineer generative AI at certain points in a, in a sequence of a workflow. That's even deeper concept of prompt engineering. And then the deepest is something I've been calling prompt plumbing, 
which is at a much lower um, layer of the infrastructure. You can use uh, approaches like LangChain, um, which does some really um, interesting, it kind of takes summaries of the big blocks of text, vectorizes it and carries the context forward. You can do things with much greater um, amounts of information than, the, than the, what happens just through an interface like ChatGPT where you run out of tokens. We'll get much more into all that later in the year. Okay, so now I wanna hand the, uh, the, the baton back to the next. Oh, okay, and now as promised, um, Dan and Michael, can you come off mute, please? Hello, Great. everyone. Greetings from Chicago land. Welcome. Um, Mike, I believe, are you, Mike, are you on your tracker right now in Michigan or what's happening here? I think I've got to unmute him. Hold on. Um, and well, let's have, there we go. Can you hear me now? Welcome. And it's by way of introduction, uh, we really look to to Michael and Dan as as um, as pillars in this this emerging space of computational law. Um, Dan arguably um, kind of coined the phrase um, before we started uh, focusing on it at MIT. And Dan, I just want to recognize you again and thank you for being a member of the board of advisors of the MIT computational law report. So with that, can you please show us how on earth you got GPT to pass in part the bar exam? Okay. Also, Des, can you add Michael as co-host so he can do video if he wants? If you really want, if you want to see me, you don't have to, obviously. We'll, but we'll do. I'm not on the tractor if that's what you're hoping for. But Folks are seeing this here? Yes. This slide? Yeah. Okay. Well, again, greetings from Chicago, Ann. Mike is joining us from uh, from Michigan uh, near the campus of Michigan State University. Uh, I guess um, maybe I can. Uh, well, I'll just keep it here for a second. Maybe I can take you a little bit back back a little bit for us. Uh, you know, we've been working in this area of large language models on the academic side for a while now, and uh, more recently on the commercial side. Uh, um, years ago, we had a company. Uh, called LexPredict, and we did a bunch of things in that company, including things like litigation prediction, contract analytics, and we had a library, and the library, one of the libraries, well, with several libraries, but one was called LexNLP, and it was focused on, uh, you know, what I think will now be called classic NLP in, in this area, uh, classic NLP, which is, uh, you know, uh, the, the historic workflow in which people did undertook NLP tasks, which is now increasingly being displaced by uh, sort of deep learning as the base, uh, as the kind of base method. And so, you know, unfortunately, this is just the nature of things. You know, you, the libraries that we built back 2016 to 2018 have been eclipsed by by other methods. And uh, so I'd say, you know, you could still use some of what was done before, but I think it's kind of, um, you know, unfortunately fallen by the wayside. So last year, we, on the academic side, we worked with this pan-European group on on something called LexClue. And this kind of was an opportunity for us to really work heavily. This, this was a benchmark analysis of several le uh, leading large language models on a wide range of tasks, including BERT, long form or big BERT, so forth and so on. And we got the paper in the ACL conference, which uh, is probably the best conference or one of the best conferences on this topic of, of natural language processing. Um, so in November, when we got out of our non-competes, we, uh, we were once, once worn to the breach, uh, uh, we started another company. And so, you know, it was in the context of doing that work. I mean, we're doing a bunch of stuff to build out this company and won't talk too much about that today, but that kind of set the conditions for us to be thinking about, okay, you know, we're building a bunch of these core tools and we've been telling folks, hey, you know, there's been a material increase in the quality of these large language models and, um, uh, you know, but, but we couldn't come up with a great way to show that to people. And then, of course, um, November 30th, about seven weeks ago, ChatGPT enters the fold, and uh, you know, uh, 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 and here we are. And here we are. So I was doing this. Uh, I run this this MOOC at a, a Bucerius Law School in Germany, uh, along with some of, with other schools, including SMU in in uh, Singapore. Uh, um, and the very last session, uh, uh, we did this introduction of Richard Suskin using ChatGPT. And we sort of said, okay, you know, I don't, I, giving these intros is always difficult. You know, you want to do the, show sort of the proper amount of fealty 
and, and what have you. And so uh, we, we said, you know, we're going to outsource this to ChatGPT. And I'll say it gave a pretty high fidelity, uh, uh, a pretty fi high fidelity uh, uh, um, introduction and, and, and even thanked Richard for, for his presentation. So right before Christmas, I called Mike and I said, I think, I think this is it. I think what we should do is try to do the bar exam. Um, there have been a few efforts, a couple of people had shown a few things online, but I said, you know, we need like a rigorous systematic treatment of this, not just kind of like plug stuff in and see what comes back out. But like, can we kind of go through this in a more systematic manner? And so, you know, we got done with Christmas uh, and we put our heads down and a few days later we had kind of version one and now we're on to the second version um, of the paper. Uh, I guess I'd just say this, I mean, uh, 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 um, language is the coin of the realm in law. And if you had to kind of say, and most roads in law lead to a document. And that document is expressed in natural language from a historical and anytime soon going forward perspective. We have had subsequent waves of legal technology. Most of the, most of the tools uh, have, that have been built to date, including anything we've built and any other tool, and I'll stand by this, really have not had a very good account for legal language. There have been clever hacks to work on these problems kind of in an indirect way, but never a frontal assault on the problem. And the problem is that there's a lot of semantic nuance in legal language, in general language, by the way, and in legal language. And now we've seen this kind of material increase in the quality of tools. And so this kind of brought us a, a, a around to say, okay, can we work on a problem that would help demonstrate to people the nature of the capabilities and the increase in the capabilities? And so we started on the bar exam. So I'm gonna pass it over to Mike and I'll be the, uh, I'll be uh, minding the slides to kind of talk us through, but I just wanted to set us up with that. Over to you. So, yep. So uh, we did what you would kind of hope we did, or at least I think it's what you'd hope we did. We went to the source of the exam in any sense, in any sense that there is an exam in a singular correct sense, right? It's the NCBE's model exam. And there's different components to the exam. Some of those are obviously better suited to um, to something like GPT, for example. The MEE or the MPT are probably um, things that GPT could do. They might be things that GPT could even do oh, um, at an adequate or passable level. But we chose the MBE portion in particular because there's not really any degree of subjectivity. It both uh, features complex syntax in the questions, questions that are, if we're being honest, purposely written to trick people, both with the length of the sentences, the complexity of the sentence structure, and the nature of the presentation of the facts, extraneous adjectives, all this kind of stuff. And there's no question as to whether Dan and Mike graded it correctly, right? We don't have access to all these NCBE or state bar graders. And so were we to do the MEE or MPT, there would be questions about whether we had faithfully reproduced an assessment as the actual student sitting for the exam would do. None of those questions for the MBE. So is it only the MBE? Yes. But does that obviously allow us to speak more objectively? Yes. So here's an example of what we got. This is from the um, NCBE's public uh, like documentation about this. We can't reproduce in full all of our questions because they assert copyright, but you can buy them for 200 bucks. And you can see, I think this is, let's see, there are one, two, three. This isn't actually so bad. These are what, four different sentences here. Sometimes these questions are one to two sentences with that many words. And the question is a, um, a four part multiple choice question. I'll point out just to be very pedantic here. The question is asking for a binary answer, but of course there are not two choices. There's actually four. so. The prompt, if read literally, which is what GPT will do sometimes, and some people do, is not really aligned with the question. And this is obviously just a part of dealing with natural language. So while, well, if you want to be really pedantic, you'd say the questions are poorly written by the NCBE and and trick even GPT. It's also just like this is, this is the way your client's going to speak to you. They're not going to be that precise. So deal with it. Next slide, Dan. So again, to baseline to talk about the students sitting for this, the uh, rates at which students correctly answer questions are presented in that rightmost column in this table. And if you've ever procured legal services and you're not an attorney who sat for this bar, those numbers might not 
instill a lot of confidence, right? Like you don't want to know that your council forgets rule 34A um, and uh, gets you into a spoliation situation because they only got 59% on the bar, but that's the way it works. So these are the numbers, quote, to beat, if you will, or these at least represent the efforts or abilities of people who spend a lot of time on this. Yeah. Uh, another key point here is ChatGPT is kind of the, the name de jour for what OpenAI offers. Uh, they offer and have offered a number of models. Some of the models are, are multi-modality models that do different things. Some of them just do one thing. Text DaVinci 3 is the best model that we could get to answer the questions. There's also a codex uh, model that has got larger token windows and supposedly better on some tasks, but Text DaVinci 3 was the, the best and largest model that actually responded, which is technically different from ChatGPT as you experience it, but supposedly the foundation. So with that detail aside, we get to the, the meat of this. And I think it was great, um, Megan and, and Daza, you guys talked it a little bit about um, very related concepts, right? So the degree to which the prompt can impact the model's response is some sense, Megan, like you said, not much different than humans. In many circumstances, the way we frame problems, the, the way that we pose the outcomes, the way that we contextualize which shared body of knowledge, or if there even is a shared body of knowledge, all those things have a huge impact in how we as humans carry on conversations. And we see that with these models. Now we have, I don't know, let's say 70 years of somewhat rigorous psychology that can at least inform human-human interaction. We do not have anywhere near that much longitudinal um, research on how human-computer interaction and these LLMs works. So what we did is try seven things that you might ask a normal student to, to do from a heuristic perspective, helping them take a test or you might just write questions this way if you've ever written questions as a professor or, or whatever. So what's the answer? What's the answer with a justification or explanation? Then some variation on that with rank ordering two, three choices. In our follow-up work on the CPA exam, we did a little bit more with um, source hallucination and source constraints, which I think you touched on, Daza. But, but for this paper, we just did these seven prompts. And when we uh, did that, as Dan said, we wanted to do this in a very rigorous scientific way, not just like a copy paste a couple bar hero questions kind of thing into, um, into this. So we tried just about every switch and flip and dial that's exposed on the API to ensure that one, the results were robust. This wasn't just like some kind of local optimal API parameter value where it magically worked. So it basically did within six or 7% across every setting that we tried. And, um, and the only thing of note probably here qualitatively is the temperature in some of these parameters have to do with how random or how reliable and deterministic the answers from GPT are. If you're doing anything where you really need to explain what you're doing or cite that you did something at a certain time in a certain way, you should be careful about your temperature values because the only way to deterministically record something to the best of our abilities with GPT is to set the temperature to zero. So we, we tried all these different things. And like I said, the short answer was it didn't really matter. And um, everybody asks, did you fine tune it? Answer was yes, to the extent that we had a couple hundred test questions and no, it didn't help. And no, we don't know exactly why, although we have a lot of theories and there's some other research about how fragile some of these models are. And the question is best answered by just not using GPT, which is something we're working on. So uh, as far as the results, I imagine a lot of you've probably seen it because it's been kind of hard to avoid in the press lately, but I was I didn't believe it at first, right? This is kind of the, the short answer because of how hard the problem was and how prior research, even from like Thomson Reuters with a lot of effort had been, let's just say, not anywhere near close to these. So the, the model does worse than the students, but not much worse in a handful of categories. And the model's top two responses are very much correct relative to what it would have gotten if it had been randomly guessing, which suggests it's very close to doing even better than what it's doing right now. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know which section you hated most for those of you who've taken the bar exam or, or those of you who have kind of practical experience with the law, which of these 
you think you actually still live today. But uh, <laughs> a lot of the questions in the exam are, are difficult. Some are more fact specific. Some involve like information that might be deemed to be outside the scope of what uh, the contextualization, like con law, for example. A bunch of the con law questions have to do with, let's say, foreign relations or, or stuff that, that may have actually been harmed by the contextualization prompts. Um, but it, it did did better than anyone expected, ourselves included, I think it's, it's safe to say. And uh, Dan, if you wanna go to the next slide, I think it's clear that something sometime, I think we said in the paper zero to 18 months from when we published will likely meet the threshold for the NCBE's kind of estimated passage rate. When that'll be, I don't know. Um, I think I'm leaning towards the under now on that range and not the over based on the acceleration that um, we're all seeing in the market. And I don't know whether you wanna talk more about what that means for the bar exam or what that means for attorneys who practice or what that means for, for public policy or what that means for clients, but any and all questions I think are obviously relevant and salient right now and, um, and real questions to ask. Maybe I'll say one thing about this. This was not in the first version we put out and we thought, you know, it'd be very, we kind of done it, but we didn't really, you know, so, you know, it'd be very helpful to, again, we want to show people kind of progress is like, let's just go back and run kind of the historical gambit of GPT models to give people a view that even 2019 and GPT-2, um, which people have used in papers to show like do things like draft patent applications and things like this, it's not even able to, to process the question. So it's a 0%. Yeah. Then in eight of like one, go ahead. Sorry, Mike. As you can see, like, and we've been using some of the commercial stuff like ALN AI models, the Bloom models, all these kind of models out there have been testing for a variety of tasks. And the prior generation of models uh, or models that could run on 48 gigs of VRAM before some of the latest 8-bit or compression techniques, like these things were struggling, again, even to respond to the prompt, right? You give a four multiple choice questions with a 500 token intro question, and it just wouldn't even, wouldn't even work. So something has materially changed even in the last six to 12 months in terms of the state of the art. I, I feel it too. That's partly why we've dedicated so much of this workshop and why we're going to be focusing on this through the year. Something big is happening right now. Something has changed. There's been a major breakthrough. I'm so glad you're both on it. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but I just want to emphasize that point that, hey, everybody, listen up. Things are, this is different than it was even just 12 months ago nine months ago even. Yeah, and I think that this chart is pretty much the proof. And I'll just, just uh, show it to you with one other example that um, is this, this same, we have the same result you see in the bottom corner, should have made a larger version of the graphic, but you see the same story. That's the CPA test. Now it gets clobbered on the math part of the CPA. You can read this paper, but like, but it, it's the same basic story. You see this material jump between GPT 3.0 and 3.5 bottom left corner as you see it so um okay back over to you mike for anything else or... yeah no and i think that the biggest point like if you think about what does the bar exam really test dan as you said earlier it's mostly a test of syntax there's some test of legal theory and and some practical um in the mbe at least that the kind of thing that you at least see in law school and that the state bars care about but but i mean honestly i think a lot of Many practicing attorneys, especially as they lean corporate, care more about the things that are tested in the CPA exam from a, a concept perspective than, let's say, whichever question California decides to throw onto the exam this year. So the, uh, the CPA exam is an interesting semantic or conceptual counterpoint to the syntactic performance of the bar exam. And to me, viewed in, in kind of complement to each other, they show this isn't just a syntax capability quantum leap. This is also a semantic um, conceptual awareness that was also previously not either present or able to be uh, exposed. So there we are. I know, I think I saw a couple questions come in. Yeah, we've got a few. I can help surface them uh, for your convenience. Yeah, do you, do you want to please kind of yeah. pick and choose? By all means. So one, one question, it's kind of seminal, it's high level, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. 
um, is uh, what does this mean for the future of the bar exam? And like if generative AI, let's say in the next revolution or evolution, um, it passes, you know, overall passes the bar. Does that mean that our bar exam or our CPA test should evolve and how? And um, can I just offer one provocation to that, which is, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately when I've been trying to grapple with what does this mean um, and how do we adapt to this uh, and make the most of it, and not fall under the bus as well. Um, you know, when, when, when the motor vehicles um, kind of came along, that was a big change, right? But so people could go a lot faster and a lot further. That didn't mean we changed the rules of the Olympics for, for running or for a marathon. So we have things that humans do. We have capabilities that machines provide that allow us to extend our reach and our power and our vision in certain ways. But it, it strikes me that the most important thing here is to look at um, look at the technology and not necessarily judge it solely against human intelligence, but let's take a look at it for what it is. Now, having said that, let me ask you guys, what is it and what does it mean for us and for the bar exam? Dan, do you want me to answer because I have less to lose in my faculty? Well, I, no, I don't, I'm, I'm, yeah, go <laughs> ahead. I mean, I'm not any big like defender of the bar exam, so go ahead though. Yeah. I think the question is, why does it exist, right? And there, there's a degree to which it exists in the absence of a regimented system with transparency. And you could talk about things like econ, lemon law, information, or you could just acknowledge that there might be longstanding um, gatekeeping dynamics that are a part of this and that the NCB itself has adjusted the difficulty of the exam solely to reduce passage rates, which doesn't strike me as necessarily relevant to the qualification of practitioners if they're just changing it to make it harder so there's fewer people to pass every year. I, I don't carry a bar card, so I can kind of say what I want on this front. Um, but I think the question is, again, uh, we said this, I think, in the intro because I, it's where I truly am on this. There is legal demand. There's kind of a, a, an uncontroversial quantity of legal demand in the market. Lots of people have tried to measure it. Uh, access to justice is kind of existing solely because we don't have either supply or access or whatever whatever kind of lens you want to take. People aren't getting the legal services that they need for one or more reasons. To me, as long as we have this unmet volume, which is not an insubstantial volume of demand for legal mm -hmm. services, especially among people who are probably, if we're being very blunt, not getting access to the best attorneys anyway, then we truly do have an ethical responsibility, regardless of what the hell the state bars tell you, but you have a true ethical responsibility in an absolute sense to try to figure out how to use these tools to help people. And does that mean give them chat GPT and say, do exactly what it says and, and I'll bill you for it. It absolutely does not mean that, right? Um, but so long as we have so many people who can't afford or access services, the ethical obligation is to figure out how to solve that. And I don't see anything that can scale and get anywhere near as close as what we just presented. Is it ready? No. But is there any other system capable of scaling to the total volume of questions that people ask in our legal systems? Happy to see it. Indeed. And speaking of the total number of questions, uh, we have another um, uh, question here uh, uh, about what what that what that corpus should be. And the question is, how, how much of GPT da Vinci's poor performance relates to the lack of the training set for specific texts in the legal um, context, the judicial it's opinion, and so forth? And, and, what, and what do you think about the next version of GPT um, in terms of maybe um, honing it or uh, doing post-training, kind of fine-tuning just in this? Or if we just make it big enough, will it, will it be able to surpass these uh, barriers? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that nobody knows because it's a kind of a closed model, despite the name of the company, is the provenance of the model. So there have been a number of publications that are peer reviewed, although peer review is limited in situations like this. Um, and they say that they're training on a set of data. The best open um, analog we have is called the pile and used in a number of models like the ones from the land community and Bloom. And the pile includes a large volume of material that includes, include but not limited to uh, the Free Law Project and NOLO. 
And in our CPA paper, for example, we explicitly ask the model to include a source or an authority or a reference to the, to the authority for its answer. And frequently it will show you a URL for something like NOLO or LII or a similar source. And so I am, I've kind of gone back and forth on this as we've collected a little bit more information. I do believe that GPT and many of these models have in them most of the public law, if you will. Do they have every complaint and pacer? I don't think so. But do they have most of the public law that you would think would be required to answer these questions? I think the answer is yes. So then it comes down to the architecture of the model, what data was used in reinforcement, with what pre-processing or post-processing or other models are in the pipeline that we experience as this singular model. And that, for GPT, I don't know how to tell you the answer. I do know the other models out there seem to know about source material. Um, source hallucination is an issue writ large, and there's techniques to handle it. And I know you referenced LangChain, too, which is a great way to control some of this stuff. But it, um, it, it's an open question, I guess. It depends in, in the most appropriate answer for this community. Well, one, one thing awesome. that should be said, though, is that we picked this test because it is not really available on the internet. That's important because otherwise it's sort of your feeding thing it's already seen. So, I mean, obviously there's a concern you do it again, then maybe it's being gobbled up. I mean, this is always an issue, but. Uh, uh, the answers the, for this exam were never sent to GPT. We just took, we detail. only took the answer back. We're trying to keep it clean, but the, but you know, you, you worry with some of the other, there are bar materials out on the web and it's probably been gobbled up in this kind of vacuum cleaner that they use to put in into the file or what have you. So, uh, or a common crawl or whatever. Uh, so this, you know, that, that was what we were trying to do is we can't, because nobody knows absolutely for certain, but this is not generally available on the web. That's mm -hmm. that we can say. We're going to need to start to segue. Um, could, I, I really, I know you're incredibly busy, but I encourage you to stick on for a few more minutes if you can, uh, Michael and Dan, because I, I want to show you, I want you to see what Jesse's come up with in his startup for, uh, by way of a, a new modality that lawyers and others can use for, for prompting. And the last little bit of color, um, as uh, Megan and I are, are in the midst of a research project trying to probe what these models can do vis-a-vis -vis fiduciary duties, one of our thoughts, or one of the things I'm starting to work on with uh, Gabe Tenenbaum and with uh, Jonathan Askin and others is to get um, faculty and experts um, uh, in fiduciary duties to help us come up with completely new uh, fact patterns and cases that have that have not only not been published, have never been thought of before. So we can really finally have confidence um, that there hasn't been leakage in the training data. That's one of the ways, it's sort of like an extraordinary measure, but at some point we have to just put our foot down and come up and be absolutely sure that we're at least getting performance on things that are novel. We did that with the CPA exam. So maybe we can share that more. We created de novo questions from the curriculum. So. We got to talk. Um, okay, so now with that, um, uh, Jesse, um, are, are you with us and can you come off on video mute? Um, I am. Thank you for, the, for handing over the stage and for setting this up, Daza. Very excited to share, you guys, to share with you guys what I've been building. Um, I think you'll find it very helpful for some of the legal use cases that you've been considering. Um, if you will allow me to share my screen, I'll jump right into a demo. Absolutely. Um, go ahead and um, hit screen share and let us know if you have a problem. Great. And Jesse, by way of introduction, it, am I correct in saying that you previously worked at OpenAI and were involved with ChatGPT? Uh, yes. So um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Multi, which is the startup that is responsible for this tool, which I'm about to demo to you. This was started back in May. Prior to that, I was working at OpenAI. Um, I worked on large language model infrastructure, did some early work on ChatGPT, dialogue systems, and grounded question answering. Um, I also achieved a new state of the art in machine translation using large language models and was a major contributor to OpenAI's a uh, theorem proving release where they applied large language models to mathematical theorem proving inside of proof assistance. Um, so, so I wanted to echo a sentiment that I uh, heard in the last presentation, which is that we need systems that are going to be able to deal with the unprecedented amount of scale 
that these large language models are going to enable. Um, and that's not scale in terms of parameters, but scale in terms of like the volume of text processing that has to be done. So I think that that same consideration applies equally well to all knowledge work in general. Um, the kind of intelligence that we see in large language, right, large language models right now is kind of like, so it's like an alien sort of intelligence, which is a pretty good approximation to like a somewhat unreliable teenager. And as these large language models become more and more commonplace, we will begin to see large amounts of knowledge work, um, not just knowledge work inside of the legal field, but knowledge work elsewhere, um, which involve processing large amounts of text, which involve operating software tools, begin to be more and more automated. And so the problem becomes, how do you orchestrate um, that kind of knowledge work automation at that kind of scale? Um, and that is the problem that Multi is trying to solve. We are building a software platform which, so which anticipates uh, this future where there's this massive abundance of near human level intelligence and automation. And um, our first product, Multiflow, which we released back in November, um, provides a visual, intuitive, and low-code interface for people to assemble AI-first workflows. Um, and let me give you an idea of what I mean. So um, I'll give you guys a bit more background on myself. Um, and this kind of showcases some of the features that we brought online in Multiflow recently um, that <clears throat> might be especially relevant for people working in the legal field. So, so we recently added um, a way for our users to upload PDFs. So this contains an uploaded version of um, an, up, an unupdated resume of mine. <clears throat> so, um, so this is a pretty long document. Um, and with resumes, it's kind of hit or miss whether or not they'll actually fit inside the context window of a large language model. Um, but we've gone to the trouble of doing the kind of plumbing that Daza mentioned um, during his talk. And we can actually handle question answering over documents of arbitrary length. So we recently added a document Q&A block, which takes in a document and a query and provides a bullet pointed list of um, so of answers which were extracted from this document. So we can ask, uh, what schools did I go to? It kind of says here, but but you know, let's pretend it's further down in the document. Um, we can also ask something like, well, what was Jesse's SAT score? Um, and we can also ask, what are Jesse's notable publications? So what's happening here is that I am building a program in a visual programming language. Um, for which Multiflow provides both a user-friendly front end and also a runtime that keeps track of all the state. And we can step through the execution of this program by clicking run. And this is all powered by large language models underneath. Um, and the amount of abstraction which is inserted between the user and the actual large language model API calls is entirely up to the user. Um, I'm operating at a fairly high level here, but later on we'll see an example where um, we actually get a bit closer to the metal <clears throat> in terms of um, uh, in terms of how much we're actually micromanaging those large language model calls. So um, let's take a look here. So so it correctly extracted the fact that I went to UCLA. I got a bachelor's in mathematics in 2015. I got a master's in math in 2018. Um, this resume is not up to date. I actually got my PhD a month ago. Um, so it also correctly sees that my SAT score is 2280, and it correctly extracts the fact that some of my major work has been in formal theorem proving and the applications of machine learning uh, to automated theorem proving in mathematics. So, um, so I'll pause here for any questions. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, let's yes, I actually use Multiflow to write the PhD. Ah, uh, that's awesome. So if we wanted to um, say generate some copy, right? Um, so so here's another example where a a visual front end for prompt chaining um, and for being able to to recursively assemble prompts and then feed them into language models and use them to produce a complex result might be useful. Suppose that you need to write a uh, short blog post about some some arbitrary topic. So in this case, I've asked it to create a blog post about um, the fact that clowns across the world have decided to go on strike. So what we've done here is we've combined few shot prompting 
where we show the language model a bunch of examples um, with the kind of structure of saying, well, now we're going to few shot prompt an introduction, we're going to few shot prompt some body paragraphs, we're going to few shot prompt a conclusion. Um, and we use the topics which are extracted from the language model call um, as prompts for actually producing the actual body paragraphs, which will be inserted inside of the blog post. And so you can see that, um, that once this entire thing is run, in fact, we can just re-execute the entire thing. Um, so we see that um, so we see that it regenerates this blog post and it also creates a bunch of images. Um, and these images can um, can be prompted so that they arise in different styles. And this is something which is possible through the uh, string formatting that we have um, through our text boxes. So as you can see here, <clears throat> um, so the way that that we manipulate text inside of this interface is that we use template variables, which are denoted by these double brackets. And so when you surround a piece of text with these double brackets, they become variables, which um, are then exposed as ports. And you can pipe input into these. Um, and so all we're doing here is we're concatenating the, the copy about clowns um, with some styling prompts. And then this becomes the input to a, a call to a stable diffusion model. Um, so now let's maybe jump over to a use case um, that might be particularly interesting uh, for people working uh, in the legal field. So, um, so here's an example of a flow which performs dialectic reasoning on some topic. Um, so suppose that you wanted to, um, to analyze the pros and cons of some controversial topic and then synthesize them. And you wanted um, a highly interpretable trace or audit trail of what the language model was thinking throughout that entire time. So what you can do in this case is you can just ask it to create bullet pointed lists of pros and cons um, and then ask it to argue against itself. So, um, so I'm going to try something different here. So I'm going to uh, try building, building more housing in San Francisco, my favorite topic. So You can see here that, so what's happening here is that we've created the instruction to uh, create a bullet pointed list of pros or potential benefits of the following topic. And this is input to a language model API call. This is our text generation block. There are some settings here where you can control various parts of the OpenAI API. Um, and <clears throat> you can see that here it generates a list of pros. Um, we can then ask it to expand um, each of these short bullet points into a full-fledged paragraph, right? So, um, so you can see that um, that this is um, piped into this text generation block, and this provides a paragraph which expands on each of these points. Um, finally, you can ask it to produce a point-by-point -point rebuttal for each of the claims which are made inside of this essay. Um, and then you feed that into another language model API call and that creates a rebuttal. So this kind of structured chain reasoning uh, is especially important for um, high touch applications um, or particularly high stakes applications which involve lots of language like legal because this provides a clear audit trail of the model's reasoning, um, what the ingredients were that went into each of its um, choices um, and uh, it also gives you the ability, or at least the interface that we have here, gives you the ability to quickly rewire the way that the model is prompted uh, in order to achieve the outcome that you want. Um, and what's happening at the bottom of this flow here is that we've just gone and reversed the chirality of this. So um, we've asked it to come up with a list of cons instead, uh, to expand that into an essay and then produce a rebuttal. Um, and then uh, from these, we can actually, um, so one thing that we could do here is we could ask the model to take these two things and synthesize them. So um, this is actually something that we can do right now. So, um, okay, so, so let's pipe in the text above and let's format it 
<clears throat> so that uh, so that the model knows that these are two different pieces of text. So this is rebuttal one, okay, and this is rebuttal two. And let's separate these with like some kind of demarcation. Okay, so above you have been given, so this kind of prompting works with the instruct models on the open API. Above you have been given um, a rebuttal of the pros and cons of topic. Oops. Given a rebuttal, the pros and cons of topic <clears throat> and a rebuttal of the, uh, oh, sorry, pros and benefits. The cons and drawbacks of topic. Synthesize these into an essay with multiple paragraphs. Um, and then let's do a little bit of prompt engineering and tell it to write an eloquent essay, an eloquent, well-articulated essay. Okay. So um, with this in place, we see that due to the formatting, which I mentioned earlier, there are three inputs. So we need to pipe in the first rebuttal, uh, and then we need to pipe in the second rebuttal, and then we have to pipe in the topic, which is all the way back here. So topic. OK. <clears throat> and finally, we can run this through the text generator to get a final output. And now let's rerun this thing again. Um, so, so this gives you guys an example of um, the kinds of rapidly and increasingly sophisticated use cases that you can achieve with complex prompting in a tool like this. And what our front end gives you is the ability to inspect the intermediate outputs to rapidly change the prompting style on the fly. Um, and also to deploy these to an API. So if you're a developer who wants to integrate this kind of technology into your own application, uh, we are actually constructing a function uh, in a visual DSL for programming large language models. That's why you see these input and output tags. And so what we have here is a function that takes in a single input, which is a topic and produces an output, which is this like well-argued articulated essay considering very carefully all the pros and cons of this topic. And this can be deployed um, to an API that you can call from inside of your own application um, or also to um, a web app that you can just create and share and which hides all of the intermediate outputs. Outstanding. Um, and so I hope you can all see why it is I wanted Jesse to share this. Um, so we, we, a lot of us have got, um, at best, a concept of a very flat interface. I mean, the great thing about ChatGPT is that it's it provided very wide, almost population scale, immediate access to the technology, but it's hardly the ceiling of how this technology can be um, uh, configured and composed and integrated into other systems. Um, and so thank you so much for showing that, Jesse. I forgot to mention uh, that I'm bending our rule a little bit here on product demos. Obviously MIT doesn't uh, endorse this product, um, this is for educational purposes to see what's possible. And um, and, and let me just ask, uh, let me start with, uh, we're gonna have to move to the next session pretty soon, but uh, Dan or Michael, um, if you have any reactions, questions or comments, I invite you to, to jump right in, um, go ahead. I would just say, this is what, when we talk about like why you, um, why you want to use an LLM and what the results that we've showed mean, this is what we're envisioning their actual use case, right? Like not a human directly asking GPT for answers, but something like this, let's say the Illinois Legal Aid Online, which Dan works with in his capacity at Chicago Kent, instead of building a rules-based triage system, which is what the ILAO does today to answer questions about, let's say, landlord-tenant disputes, for tenants in the state of Illinois would replace the rules-based system or parts of that rules-based triage system for people who are trying to deal with their legal problems with something like this. It would be inside of this um, larger ecosystem or if we're being honest, a real product. And this is just a component in a product, not a product itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's the future that we're heading towards and eventually um... Systems like this are going to become more and more widespread. And 
and we're going to be living in a world that is going to be orchestrated by, by language model programs like this. She came up. No, I just, I, this is great. Congratulations on this. Uh, um, this, I think, is great, a great follow up from what we had shown because this kind of shows you um, where, where you can take all, take all of this. Particularly, I like this idea. I mean, just from an ed, for, for like an education perspective, teaching my students about like, you know, when we do legal composition, we think about the relative weights or merits of arguments in law. This is a way to kind of, to sort of enable that enable them to see those kind of, uh, I don't know, the battle royale between these arguments or, or what have you. I can imagine just in teaching legal writing. I um, mean, you asked this question earlier about what, what about what's the future of the bar? I mean, uh, I mean, how about we use, how we have a measure to, of people's performance, but you, you have to, you can use the best tools available to then solve some theoretic client problem and that's your demonstration. And so if this is the tool you have, then you get to use it and you get to use any tool. And, and that, that, I, that's the world I'd like to head to, which is you use the best in class tool to solve the people's problems. Yeah, anyway, I don't want to turn this into a revival, but it'll happen very quickly otherwise. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I didn't get a chance to show you, but, um, but the document Q&A feature, which I started the presentation with, is actually very useful for analyzing contracts. It nails most questions like for a purchase agreement, what are the obligations to the buyer and seller and so on. Um, so there are lots of use cases. Um, I'm going to drop a link to the website that I was using in the chat. Um, and I encourage you guys to uh, sign up for the wait list and come check it out. Thank you so much, um, all of you, for giving everybody an introduction to what this technology is and what's possible. And uh, not only are tools evolving, but the technology itself, you know, just stay, you know, put your seatbelt on for Claude from Anthropic and for GPT-4. Um, so this truly is the beginning. Okay, now, uh, Joshua, welcome everybody to the special session of Fireside Chat with Joshua Browder of Do Not Pay. We're so glad that Joshua is able to join us today, and this is actually his second appearance um, at law.mit.edu's computational law report. Um, if you look on our media page, you can see a very interesting kind of stage setting podcast that um, Brian and I did with him Oh gosh, about a year ago now, or maybe a little more. Um, and so much has changed since then, thanks to the ready availability of generative AI. And I can't think of anybody who has done more creative and provocative work with this technology in a legal context than Joshua Browder. And I want to thank you again for, for joining us uh, and ask you if you'd be willing to give a brief introduction of yourself and do not pay. Well, I'm sorry, one other standard disclaimer. Of course, we don't, MIT does not endorse, uh, do not pay as a company or any of their products or services. This is educational. And I do think it is very informative to see what is possible, especially in a consumer context. So with, with that, Joshua, uh, maybe we could unshare the screen so we can see Joshua. And um, I'd like to invite you to introduce yourself, your company, and to maybe let us know, what have you been doing with generative AI and GPT uh, through your company for consumers? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a shame to hear that MIT doesn't endorse Do Not Pay, but I understand. Um, so at a high level, Do Not Pay is automated consumer rights. We uh, like to call ourselves the world's first robot lawyer. And we've been operating since 2015, and we've had a huge amount of success with templates. So rules-based systems, where if this happens, we send an angry letter to the government or a corporation to get a refund or get someone out of their parking ticket. And that has been taken us very far. We've won over 2 million cases just with letters. But what's really exciting is in the past year, um, the AI models available um, with companies like OpenAI and GPTJ, which is the open source version of GPT-3, have really, in my opinion, improved by 10x. And because of that, it's allowed us to actually go back and forth with these companies um, and governments with disputes. So we've done things like automatically um, negotiated live with Comcast live chat, where our bot talks to Comcast. Comcast, perhaps they're using an AI, talks back, and our AI legal assistant uh, negotiates a bill down. We've um, had a bot phone up a bank and using a synthetic voice to negotiate to get a wire ref refund. And next month, we're taking it to the next level 
where we're actually um, having a physical courtroom uh, introduce the robot lawyer, where the um, bot will be whispering in someone's ear what to say in a speeding ticket case. So we're really trying to push the boundaries of bringing this technology to ordinary people, because typically when uh, there's a powerful technology like AI, it gets in the hands of the big corporations and the government first. So we want to give power to the people and actually give consumers access to this so that they can fight for their rights. The work that you are doing, uh, you know, frequently, too frequently, when it comes to powerful new technologies, the little guy, individuals and consumers are, are the ones that are almost subject to it. And sometimes they don't come, we don't come out as well in, in the overall deal. It's so great to see you applying this creatively and effectively on behalf of consumers. I want to ask you if you could go back one half step. Um, the You made a quick reference to it was wire fees that I believe you had refunded from yes. a bank. And you kind of said it very quickly, but I was hoping you could go... Uh, a little in a little more depth to talk about what I thought was a very intriguing integration of voice to text, generative AI, um, text to voice, and then how you went from a phone tree to talking to a live person. Like, just tell the story of what 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 you did there and what's possible. Yeah. So all of these AI language tools are useless if you can't actually communicate their outputs to where they need to go. And so that's what we specialize with at Do Not Pay. And we have bots that go on these websites and do all the clicking and submit this text to get a response. And so we decided to take it a step further. There's an amazing API, it's called Resemble API, and it allows you to clone your voice. So you can record five minutes of you talking to the AI, and then the AI will uh, replicate you and your voice. So then we used a Twilio bot to phone up Wells Fargo and it was my voice in a robotic form talking to them. And the conversation was powered by GPT-3. The voice was powered by a different AI called Resemble. And then we actually had other AIs as guardrails because there's huge uh, limitations with this technology, which I can kind of go into, that the biggest limitation is the AI talks too much. So if, if a representative is saying like, um, hang on, let me, let me, uh, let me look at it. Um, the AI um, is inclined to have a three sentence response. And so we've actually have another AI, which even decides whether to say something or not, because it was talking too much. And this is going to be a problem for our courtroom case coming up. So it's a good test for that. And then the final thing I would say is that the AI exaggerates and lies a lot. Um, with our Comcast dispute, when we sent the AI to get a discount, it said, I had five outages in the past 24 hours or something like that. And that might be a good strategy, but from a liability perspective, um, it's not very good for do not pay. So we've had to prompt, it's all about the prompt, what you're prompting these models. And so we've prompted it to say, stick to the facts, um, don't exaggerate. And we've managed to clean it up using that as well. video and was uh, amazed um, uh, at your demo of how the result of this rather um, experimental, I would almost call it, use of this chain of technologies was that you got your wire fees refunded from the bank. Um, it, it was a triumph. What, one little question is I noticed when I tried to find the video, um, it looks like Twitter has taken yeah, they, it down as a violation. What, what's that all about? Twitter has a violation saying you can't have um, deep fake voices, videos, and so they flagged it and they took it down. Is a voice representation a fake when you are the person who are choosing to use it as a proxy of yourself? Is that fake or is that an extension of your real identity? So we have a compliance team at Do Not Pay of real lawyers and they always are very upset with me because I'm always pushing the boundaries. And so that was a good point. And um, we decided that to reduce our exposure of this experiment, it would be better if I was the one who did it. Um, so that that's that, that's why we did it, because at least there'll be a court, court argument saying that I was just calling them myself and using a, a assistive technology. Yeah. What when in the media lab, when we think about artificial intelligence, we focus on what we call um, basically uh, kind of cognitive extension 
um, and, and looking at ways that it can not replace people, but actually expand and extend our capabilities. And so I think I would say that what you did there is right in the center of one of the things, at least I have in mind, about how this type of technology can help people manage this myriad of relationships we have as consumers with all of these companies and government agencies and other organizations, all of whom are using AI. What about us? Can we use it too? Yeah, so um, the courtroom stuff is an experiment. It's it's on the borderline illegal. So we're not making a product out of that, but we have several really exciting AI products coming out. Um, one re we released yesterday that summarizes terms and conditions. Um, we have more advanced ones coming out where you can upload a medical bill and the AI will go on the No Surprises Act and dispute the bill. And I think it's really good for people for two reasons. The first is that a lot of people can't afford to get access to their rights. Um, these big, the big companies have a business model of concentrated benefit, but spread out harm. So I think we discussed this in the last call, but um, Comcast can charge a million people $10. They make $10 million. It's great for Comcast, but the people being charged $10 or $12, like in my wire fee case, they don't have time to uh, call up uh, Comcast and waste their time over $12. And so that's a great job for software. And then finally, I think it can really make access to justice affordable, um, especially with these more expensive cases like medical bills. Uh, of uh, the AI as sort of its own entity or, a, you know, like let's say an open AI or a anthropic entity um, versus the AI being used as a proxy or an agent of a person, and therefore having the affordances of the rights and obligations and the roles of that person, a consumer. So let's, but instead of a consumer, let's talk about lawyers. You know, it's law.mit.edu. We love technology and law. So uh, part of that is practice of law. Um, what, how do you think this is going to play out in a litigation context when lawyers are using the technology and the way you have in mind for this next, this next, um, activity of, um, of basically having it provide um, information for them that they would say, would this be deemed a, an assistant of the attorney operating under their license? Or would it potentially, as I'm seeing in the chats, people are yeah. using that chilling phrase, unauthorized practice of law. So just to give some more context, so in December over Christmas, I tweeted out an offer on Twitter and it said, um, does anyone want to be the first ever AI court case? Uh, we'll pay even if you lose. And we're actually going to even throw in some additional compensation for the risk of uh, contempt of court and other things. And um, the tweet was seen by millions of people. And uh, I had 300 different offers um, for people to participate. And so our team looked through all of these cases, and we were really looking for three things. The first is um, wiretapping laws. So for the AI to even process the what the judge or someone is saying, you're going to have to record it and broadcast it. And some states are one-party consent states where just one person can record, but other states require everyone who's being recorded to give their permission. So that was the first thing that ruled out a lot of cases. The second thing was around as you said, unauthorized practice of law. Some state statutes like California are very broad and entities and corporations and anyone can unauthorized practice of law. And so it's a, it's a gray area in places like that, those. But the way these statutes are written, they, no one could have ever imagined that AI would, there would be robot lawyers. And so in some states, the statutes are very specific to a human being pretending to be a lawyer. They were written for like in the days when mechanics were pretending to be a lawyer back in the olden days. And so it doesn't really have the concept of do not pay in mind. And so there's some places where it's completely legal and we're not too worried about that. And then finally, there's local courtroom rules. Some courtrooms like the Supreme Court ban electronics, other courtrooms you're allowed to have electronics and so things like that. Indeed. Um, it's, so, you know, it's funny you mentioned mechanic of all things, because yes. we, we're we really fascinated by the potential of what we call legal engineering, or basically mechanics of law. And we think yeah. in the information age, actually, mechanics are going to be a really good skill to have in the, in, you know, in the digital economy. So um, it's a particularly uh, poignant example. 
Um, so how do you imagine, so, I mean, we're obviously in a time of early experimentation. I think you're, I think it's safe to say you're a leader um, when it comes to um, creative new use cases. Can you help me look over the horizon a little bit? I'm sure you've been thinking about this, but what, what after the first wave or two of evolution and adaptation of this technology for, let's say, legal practice in the courtroom, that's such an interesting, dramatic uh, scenario, how do you think that this technology would be integrated as a matter of course and you know, taught in law schools and ha have a rules of procedure in courts that recognize it as being a place? Will it be sort of like a laptop along with everything else on people's desk? Will it be this sort of real time um, speaking on our behalf or how might it play out in practice? I think people should have a right to have AI advise them in courtroom hearings if they're a pro se litigant. Um, as of right now, no no state allows that. But our goal with this case, especially if we win, is to set a point that um, it, it is an access to justice issue and it can open it up. Um, I think it's also an accessibility issue. A lot of people struggle to read all of the laws and understand all of the text. And um, AI can help them uh, overcome that on an accessibility front. And so maybe there could be some ADA litigation around allowing AI in courtrooms, which I would be excited about. Um, I, I think that the, the problem is the people creating the rules, the bar associations have an incentive, unfortunately, to keep prices high. And so that's the pessimistic argument. The optimistic argument is that there's not a single lawyer who's going to get out of bed over a $500 small claims court case. And so this is really an underserved need. And so perhaps it's not even about replacing lawyers. It's all it's about expanding access. Um, I think that there will be some lawyers who should be very worried, like the ones you see on billboards. So uh, the show Better Call Saul, he, he should be worried, but um, others don't really have to create regulations, they, they should be forward thinking. You're here. And in particular, it raises the question when, when, when other sides are using the power of these tools, if you are being, you know, kind of artificially restricted from using it, is that in effect a kind of, are you being handicapped? Uh, maybe there's uh, some new interpretations of ADA and new, uh, new expectations reflected and supported in regulation and procedure that that we're going to have to look at, at, at adopting. Speaking of that, um, I want to come back now to uh, another kind of big picture over the horizon um, concept that, that I think your early work is, has raised. And that is um, what you did with the wire fee refund and the Comcast bill, um, yeah. at least initially uh, with the um, on the wire refund, you had to go through a kind of a phone tree. And with yes. Comcast, I think it was entirely uh, the chat bot on the Comcast side. Do you imagine um, a ecology where consumers have um, AI-based technology that is sort of the inverse or converse reciprocal um, service to companies and government agencies um, in, a, in a large scale so that we basically have sort of like um, general, more standard types of APIs and interactions and maybe guardrails or boundaries for the context of certain interactions um, in some way? Or, or how do you see it playing out when we have bot versus bot between consumers and organizations? So the AI arms race has just begun. Um, we see that we've seen this for the past few years at Do Not Pay, where every action we take has an equal and opposite reaction from the companies, where um, we're going to see things like um, voice verification. So they're going to use AI, and a lot of banks already do this on the back end. They don't tell you that they're doing it. But if it's not your voice, um, they make the call suspicious until you're already on a losing front. Um, so the good news is that do not pay is much more motivated than the average Comcast engineer. And so we, in the past, we've succeeded at these arms races. Another example is um, when we started sending in parking ticket letters, the government started ignoring um, letters that came from do not pay. So we randomized the letters and then they stopped ignoring it because they couldn't be sure that it was coming from us. So there's all these steps that are gonna be taken from both sides. Um, Regarding the Comcast chat specifically, um, you can't even tell whether it's a bot or not. I think it was a bot for part of the conversation, but then a human being for the rest. Um, and 
even though it might not have been a bot towards the end, the customer service agents are unfortunately just acting within the script. They have a very set certain set of parameters that they can authorize a refund or not. And so I think one of the biggest insults in life going forward will be, you sound just like ChatGPT. And so unfortunately, uh, the customer service agents already sound like ChatGPT, whether they are or they're not. And so um, it will free up the work for them and also free up the work for consumers and the bots will just do the hard part to get the $12. Outstanding. So in effect, maybe you can imagine a, a kind of a funnel where the consumer can just look at the, the ultimate result of the question to be asked or the selection to be made and not have to go through all of the all of the rigmarole to get there, maybe on a dashboard or something like that. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. And, and the good news is that there are a lot of rights that people have that are enshrined in federal law. Like, for example, um, if you have an agent uh, appeal your credit report, uh, to dispute something on your credit report, just because it comes from an AI, they still can't ignore it under the law. And so because the, and the laws, the way they're written is like, if it comes in a letter or X format, so they just, so they can't uh, gatekeep a lot of these use cases. And that's also helpful for us. It would be an interesting application of this technology uh, for consumers. I know we've talked about now the sort of help desk um, uh, context who talked about litigation, especially pro se. I was asking about lawyers, but you very appropriately went to people that aren't represented by lawyers where the access to justice um, is uh, case is very compelling. What, what other contexts do you think this technology could be useful for? I think it's all about going from uh, proactive to retroactive. So what I mean by that is right now, um, do not pay people come to us with a problem. They like, I want to get a refund for the in-flight Wi-Fi. But in the future, the AI will be so good, it will save you money in the background, like a true general counsel. Like Walmart has a general counsel just working in their, working for their best interest. And I think AI lawyers will, will do that. So they'll be looking at your bills automatically and figuring out ways to fight back and you can just relax. So you don't even have to think about it. Um, in terms of specific things we're working on, like for example, on the medical bill side, there's this amazing law, it's called the No Surprises Act. And it means that hospitals have to uh, publish all of their prices. But the problem is in typical um, compliance fashion, they, they just publish like these obscure PDFs just to comply with the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. So what we're doing right now is we're having AI go in and crawl all of these hospital websites and take all of their information and make it into a standardized format. So we're actually building an AI hospital price comparison website. So I'm excited by those sorts of use cases. So I think just understanding information, uh, presenting arguments, and also just figuring out ways that you don't have time uh, to kind of look at yourself. Outstanding. So we, we've got a question now from one of our longtime collaborators and uh, also an advisor of uh, MIT's computational law report, Brian Ulysny, who we affectionately know as Cool Brian. Um, he asked, as he recalls in the amazing Wells Fargo demo, his words, and I agree, yeah. you simply asked for a refund. You didn't provide any arguments in your behalf. Would that have been possible or might that be possible in the future? Yeah, so... Um... It, it definitely is. So on the Comcast example, it provided arguments about FTC statutes around like quality of service. Um, there's a negotiation angle and there's also a legal angle. And if, if you combine them, then you can have success. Um, we, we should have provided some arguments for the wire fees. We just wanted to be, uh, we, we were worried that they could tell it wasn't a real voice. So we limited what the AI could say as well. So there were lots of constraints, but in the Comcast example, we're certainly citing FTC statutes and stuff. That I've been thinking about as you've been speaking, um, which is this idea of real versus not real, um, which I think is incredibly superficial and backward looking in some ways and need to a full, a fresh rethink for going forward. So on, on that, I just want to pose the question and invite you to go anywhere. I could see you were about to say something, so don't lose that thought. But the question I have also is, would it be useful as, as um, chat centers and courts and other processes that are official um, start to adapt to this technology to have a kind of a recognition that sometimes 
people are going to be using this technology to exercise our rights and to engage in the systems and, and to basically have a kind of a disclosure or like a field that we could set saying, this part is coming from my authorized electronic agent, which is this yeah. bot technology. And that way we can just dispense with this whole question. It's real. And it also happens to be the bot that I've authorized. I, I think there will be rules around that. Um, so um, OpenAI um, for their GPT-3, uh, DaVinci model and others, they have guidelines that all businesses using their technology have to follow. And one of them is just what you said, that you have to, if you have a bot, you have to disclose that it's a bot. And that's not very helpful for us because if if we say to Comcast, this is a bot, they'll just end the conversation. So the way we get around that is, um, I mentioned earlier in the call, we use GPTJ, which is an open source model. Um, so we use the heavy lifting on the back end for open AI, but we also, we use open source models to actually communicate to stop these kind of regulations, gatekeeping regulations. I think that there's an argument to be made that um, if someone says it's a bot, maybe it loses 90% of its effectiveness. Like chat, uh, I use chat GPT to write me a thank you note for a Christmas present. If it says this was generated by AI, then the kind of meaning of the thank you note goes away. And the same could be true for these legal cases. Indeed, yeah. It, so there's, uh, there's a lot more to do in the future as we learn how to adopt and appropriately adapt to the infusion of this technology for consumers and for governments alike. Uh, so can I just give you this opportunity, uh, sort of free swim, to just close with any thoughts or challenges or ideas that, that you'd like to leave with people, including questions you may have for us? Um, I, I think this technology is overhyped and underhyped at the same time. It's overhyped because um, ChatGPT is really good at holding a conversation. It's really good at writing thank you cards and this generic stuff. But what we found at Do Not Pay is that it actually hallucinates regarding the law. It makes up laws and things like that. And the re reason we've been able to use the technology successfully is because we have all this training data from the past seven years. Um, we've like basically, we, instead of saying write a dispute to Comcast, we say based on these a thousand documents, write a dispute. And the quality is like much better if you give it, if you almost retrain it. So I like to say chat GPT is a good high school student, but you have to send it to law school. So in the context of this discussion and the law, I think it all depends on the training data and making sure you have really good data um, and uh, wish us luck for our court case next month. Us at this um, MIT workshop uh, on behalf of everybody at law.mit.edu and all of our participants, uh, we truly do wish you luck and we hope that you'll come back and join us as you've gone through some of these early experiments to let us know how it went and what's next after that. Sounds good. If I'm not in county jail, I'll come back to <laughs> present. <laughs> Great. And, and well, you should have a bot to definitely defend your rights to stay out of jail. So thanks again, Joshua.